Welcome, Kristen. Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. <laughs> um, so uh, I co-founded the Granular Mechanics and Regular Operations Lab, which is this side of the high bay, <laughs> along with Rob Mueller about 10 years ago. And our objective is to learn how to use the regolith, the resources of space, well, anywhere you go in space that you can land and walk, it's almost certainly going to be covered with regolith, which is broken up solid particulate me media. And um, it's really difficult to work with granular materials. Even here on Earth with, with thousands of years working with soil, we still don't understand the basic physics of granular materials. I did my doctoral work in the physics of granular materials. And it's an active area of research. But if we go somewhere in space, we don't have an infrastructure base there already. That's what we've got to work with. We have to land on it. We have to drive on it. We have to dig in it. We have to process it for resources. Then we're going to have to um, build with it, so construction and fabrication. And we also want to study it for the geological record to understand the solar system and anywhere else we go. So um, the first problem is landing on it. When you <laughs> land on unconsolidated granular material with a rocket exhaust, you blow it, obviously. And you might make a big crater, like on Mars, that's the problem, building a, <clears throat> digging a big hole and then landing in unstable soil. Or on the moon, uh, the problem is not all for the first mission, the problem is the second time you land in the same location, you sandblast everything else that's already there. And so we've been looking at ways of building a landing pad. And uh, Paul Hinsey, who just talked the trash to gas system, is our local expert on sintering soil. So this is simulated lunar soil that we worked with a company to develop a method of microwaving it to create a landing pad material. And so are these. These were done in an oven, so you have a lot better process control. Trying to do it just open on the surface, it came out all bumpy, of course. Um, we, this is shuttle launch pad material. These are simulated lunar soil with polymer added. Now, we had two of these plates put together because we wanted to fly a rocket over them at um, the Mojave Mast and Space Systems. So one of the two has been subjected to rocket exhaust. Can you guess which? <laughs> Any clues, yeah. maybe? Yeah, so this one was actually, the, the Mast and Space Systems did what they call putting fire on it for us. They put some fire on this one. And the, uh, the polymerized lunar soil uh, burn through somewhat. It's not great for direct plume impingement, but it'd be great for like an apron of a launch pad where you're trying to prevent erosion, but you're not dealing with high temperatures. Um, the microwave lunar soil worked fantastic. So um, this is an actor of area of research. We're um, also looking at construction, building bricks. This was simulated lunar soil that we added polymer to. We're collaborating with uh, Barack Koshnevis at the University of Southern California. He has a company called Contour Crafting. He has a lot of patents on 3D printing of entire buildings. And he has a couple of contracts with NASA, and we're collaborating to develop construction methods. Oh, by the way, this is a piece of the space shuttle launch pad. Every launch of the shuttle blows chunks out. And we can pick these up a kilometer, a couple kilometers away from the launch pad. Every launch. Um, so come on around. Um, so I mentioned the first thing you have to do is you have to land on it. The second thing is you have to drive on it. And, um, and then we don't study traction, uh, mobility so much at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, mostly that work is done at Glenn and, and uh, Ames and other, and of course JPL for robotic missions. Um, the third thing you have to do is dr dig in the soil to, ex to uh, excavate it as a resource, to build landing pads, to build roads. And so AJ Nick, Rachel Cox, <laughs> Jason Schuler and several other engineers here at the Kennedy Space Center have been developing excavators for the moon and Mars and asteroids. So they're going to show you razors. If you, check, if you Google razor spelled with two S's in the middle, R-A-S-S-O-R, Google razor NASA, it's been all in the news the last two days. Can I show them that so. picture real fast? Um, this is a little artist sketch of how it kind of fits in with the bigger picture if you guys want to pass it around. That would be Mars, for example, or you could go to the moon. Um, the lander right behind you is what's in the sketch. So Razor would be supporting um, something on the lander that would process the soil. 
Yeah, so uh, Razor was kind of designed, as she said, around that mission that's in the picture there. And so the goal of Razor would be to drive out and collect dirt with its uh, two bucket drums. And so um, we call them kind of bucket drums because they not only like dig the soil, but it can actually sto store the soil inside of each drum. And so you can sort of see it here in this one where you've got an inner chamber where dirt can collect. And then, so if you spin it one direction, it actually... So if you spin it one direction, in this direction it's digging. And then if you spin it the um, other direction, it'll actually dump. Um, so, so what we do is we go out and dig and collect the dirt and then drop it off back at the lander. Um, the other capabilities of what this robot has is um, the arms can raise and lower and adjust the dirt, but these arms can go from one tread all the way around to the other tread, so you can actually lift up the robot and do what we call acrobatics, where you can stand the robot up and actually have an arm hanging out so that you can drive up to that hopper, stand up, and bring your arm over the hopper and dump dirt. Um, but the biggest kind of uh, thing that we uh, try to design with this uh, robot is that if you take this to the moon, or Mars, uh, in the case of the uh, moon, it's one-sixth of its weight here on Earth, and then it'd be one-third of its weight on Mars. Um, so when you get up there, this only weighs, this like in, on the moon, I think this is going to only weigh like 30 pounds, is that what you were saying earlier? Yeah. 30 pounds. And so that's not a whole lot of weight. So typically when you try to excavate things, um, you need weight of your vehicle to be able to push. And, so, and for traction, it'd be your weight times a factor like 0.5 or yeah. 0.3. So the total force for digging you're going to get is 30 times 0.3. It's like so it's really low. Like so compared to like caterpillars and things like that on Earth that weigh like tons, uh, these will, won't have a lot of weight to be able to excavate. So the way the drums work, um, they counter, they rotate opposite each other. So one drum's reaction force uh, from digging is actually counteracted by the other drum. And we actually were to prove that through gravity offload testing, um, where we actually uh, offloaded uh, one sixth or five sixths of its weight um, and was able to uh, engage one drum. And you can actually watch the rover push away and it's not collecting dirt uh, because it's too light. And then you engage both drums and they engage in and the rover stops pushing and actually will stop and collect dirt. And then you can start driving your tracks while you're digging. Uh, which is one of our operations because we're supposed to trench with this as well. So. Okay, we've done ice mining tests. We now know that the moon has vast quantities of ice in the poles and the shadowed areas. They say that if you were to use the water on the poles of the moon to launch the space shuttle, you could launch one space shuttle every day for a thousand years. That's how much water is available there. And the reason we want to use the resources of space, first of all, is to enable missions, to enable exploration. Um, Brad Blair at the Colorado School of Mines many years ago did a study showing that if you use the propellants that you can make on the moon and then use propellants that you make on Mars or Phobos, the lower moon of Mars, you can reduce the cost or the mass of a Mars mission, the, the rocket to lift it from Earth and everything, by a factor of five, three to five. And so roughly scaling to cost, that means you can reduce the cost of the program by a factor of three to five. So another way to look at it is we're, it's a way to bring Mars five times closer to Earth and makes Mars much more accessible. So um, I'm just being silly there saying bring Mars closer to Earth. But um, economically, you can make Mars much more accessible by using the resources of space. So the next thing, after you collect the dirt, is you put it in the, into the resource processor and you extract resources. So turn around this way, and I want to show you. Um, these are three samples of tephra, which is, uh, tephra is anything that was transported aerially from a volcano. So this is tephra from Mauna Kea. And the reason they're different colors is because it starts out reddish, and by the time we extract the oxygen out of it, it's darker because we've unrusted it. We've um, un reduced it chemically. So it was oxidized, rusted. We've reduced it and got the oxygen out. Um, so, but the problem is, how do you get soil into a chemical reactor and then back out again without jamming? So we have um, we have some examples of simulated lunar soil. This is. Cocoa Beach Sand. This is OB1, which is a Canadian olivine by Townite 1. Um, OB1, there's a second generation of OB1, they call it Kenobi. <laughs> Chemically enhanced OB1, as well as Kenobi. Um, then there's NU, and, and by the way, 
Oh, I'm not going to say that joke. Never mind. Aww. Aww. The force is strong with this one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to dig. It's very hard to dig in this one. It, the force is the sheer stress is strong with this one. Um, NULHT is a, another NASA simulate. Uh, it simulates the lunar highlands terrain. This is JSC-1. It simulates the dark spots on the moon, which is the maria, the more lava, more mafic minerals. And this is the, the coarse and the fine particles of this. Now watch how well they flow. See, cocoa beach sand, no problem. The coarse particles, no problem. Even the, the, this simulant, which is not a high fidelity simulant, flows pretty well. But the high fidelity lunar soils, they just will not flow. Now consider going to lunar gravity or Martian gravity or asteroid gravity, you know, which is almost nothing. Um, gravity is not going to help you move materials through a chemical processor. So Dr. Jim Monavani here has been developing methods of conveying soil. And let me mention, first of all, before Jim takes over here, if your soil jams, if it does this, your entire Mars program is now dead. Because if you cannot create the, the propellants for the trip back, then you can't send the humans. And so you have got to send hardware that's going to operate without failure for up to two years, generate all the propellants you need without ever jamming so that you can send the humans. So it's got to be perfect. So, yeah, so you can imagine any mechanical uh, equipment that involve gears that interact with the regolith are going to jam. So we, we, we thought about uh, these ISRU reactors that are trying to produce oxygen. Uh, they're going to need air compressors or gas compressors to handle that gas. And we thought, why not use that compressed gas as a, as a means of conveying the regolith, you know, from, uh, from an excavator hopper where, where an uh, excavator deposits the regolith into a hopper into the chemical reactor. And so we've developed uh, a, what's called a pneumatic method of conveying regolith that uses compressed gas to do this. And you can convey it over large distances using just the force of pressurized gas. So as long as uh, you're, you're using, uh, you're developing systems that use compressed gas, you can also use that as a source of energy to convey the regolith. And uh, our method doesn't have outside of the compressor doesn't have any uh, moving parts that could jam. So that's a, uh, it's a big benefit to us. So Jim has developed um, experiments that have flown in reduced gravity. It works great, even super low gravity. Um, we're going to point you guys over this direction. Oh, before I send you to Van, I want to show you one more cool thing. So trying to understand how rocket exhaust blows soil, we've spent a lot of years studying that. The physics are not well understood. Even after I've worked on this for 10 years with a team of folks here, and is John gone? John Lane? Yeah. Um, so we spent 10 years trying to understand the physics of how rocket exhaust blows soil. The biggest problem is trying to understand the erosion rate with a supersonic rocket exhaust blowing a really weird soil in low gravity where it's rarefied flow. Um, so the best data available are from the Apollo missions. Apollo 12 landed 160 meters away from Surveyor 3 which had been on the moon for two and a half years. They wanted to go there to bring back pieces of Surveyor 3 um, because they wanted to study how the materials on Surveyor 3 withstood the lunar environment. What they discovered was they landed too close. Um, they tried to, they knew there was going to be a problem with sandblast and they did take some measures to land a little bit far away, but even at 160 meters it really sandblasted this. This is a piece from Surveyor 3. It was brought back by the Apollo 12 astronauts and you'll notice the white uh, and I'll, I'll, move, I'll bring it around so everybody gets a closer look, but the white is where a washer had covered, protected the paint. That's the original color. The darkening everywhere else is actually lunar dust. And you'll notice that the, there's a little rim, like a crescent moon of darker, behind the, the washer. That's where the bolt head protected it from the sandblasting in the Apollo 12 landing. So there was actually more dust on it before it got sandblasted. The sandblasting actually knocked dust off of it. Because at two kilometers per second, dust particles bounce. They don't stick. And so it was knocking dust off. But it's all cracked up. There's embedded soil particles. The paint is all cracked. And by using this, we were able to calibrate how much soil hit the surveyor. Unfortunately, we discovered because Surveyor was in a crater, only about one one thousandth of the amount hit it that would, that compared to what would have hit it if it had been on level ground. 
So we, we only got a rough estimate still of the uh, flux, but um, if you'd like to see a close look. Um, and I'm going to send you guys over to Van Townsend next. He's going to talk about 